I want to thank all of those who helped make this conference possible. Our partners in this have been the Sixth Floor Museum at Dealey Plaza, SMU's McGuire Center for Ethics and Public Responsibility, SMU's John Goodwin Tower Center for Political Studies, and SMU's Center for Presidential History. I want to especially thank Jeff Engel and his crew at the Center for Presidential History. They've been amazing in putting together so many aspects of this conference and overseeing a myriad of details. I also want to thank our private partners at the Bush Center for making this beautiful auditorium available to us this evening. And of course, I thank our Bush Library and Museum staff who've helped with the conference planning and those who are here helping out tonight. Especially want to note uh, and thank Elizabeth Coggins, Heather Nice, and John Arell. And of course, a big thanks to our wonderful panelists and moderators, and of course, to our speaker this evening, Ambassador Hughes. This has been a really tremendous day with so many interesting perspectives uh, from our presenters. I hope all of you have visited the Bush Library and Museum already, but if not, please do come back and see our museum. Uh, we opened our galleries to the public last May, on May 1st, and since then we welcomed over 360,000 visitors to our galleries. We've also opened our research room where our archivists work hard every day to make available the vast archives of the Bush presidency. And we've already accomplished a great deal also in education, making partners here and around the nation as we teach about the presidency, about American history, and about the importance of using documents, of using the raw material of history to truly understand our shared American heritage. Now, to the reason you all are here, not, not to hear me talk. Uh, we are so honored to have with us tonight Ambassador Karen Hughes who currently serves as the worldwide vice chair of the international communications firm, Burson Marsteller. Karen is one of the world's foremost communication strategists with over 35 years of public policy, communications, and political experience. Ambassador Hughes previously served as counselor to the president for President George W. Bush, where she advised the president on policy decisions and led the White House offices of communications, press secretary, media affairs, and speech writing. She also served as Under Secretary of State for Public Diplomacy and Public Affairs. And if you've read her wonderful book titled 10 Minutes from Normal, you will also see that she is a dedicated wife and mother and longtime Sunday school teacher. Of course, I would be remiss given where we are if I didn't note that Ambassador Hughes is also a proud graduate of Southern Methodist University. Uh, when I ask Ambassador Hughes to speak for us this evening, I ask if she would give us a perspective beyond the public facts of how presidents deal with crises. And instead, in the spirit of our conference, I ask her to give me kind of more of a personal perspective of how she dealt with the many crises of the Bush administration and how she saw the president confront and overcome those really very daunting challenges. So please join me in welcoming Ambassador Karen Hughes. Thank you, Alan. Thanks so much. Well, good evening. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thanks, Alan. Alan's been an instrumental partner to President and Mrs. Bush in the development and now the operation of this library and museum. I know Alan first met with the President and Mrs. Bush back in the Oval Office, the Oval Office in D.C., not the one here, uh, back in the fall of 2008. And Alan, you've obviously made great use of the six years since, so thank you for all your work and, and great leadership. I want to thank the sponsors of tonight's event and also thank my mom and sister and husband Jerry who are somewhere here in the audience, which is a rare treat for me. And it's always great to be back on the SMU campus, which is my alma mater, and we have to wish them very good luck tonight in the basketball game, which I understand is causing some of the traffic you had to fight through to, to get here tonight. I'm very honored to be a part of this conference, which brings together so many of our country's most respected historians and scholars. I am neither, but I was privileged to witness and be a part of some of the history of the presidency of George W. Bush, a very consequential eight years that certainly saw what sometimes felt like more than our fair share of crises, uh, from the attacks of September 11th to the natural disaster of Hurricane Katrina to the financial crisis of the fall of 2008. And as Alan said, he asked me to share some personal stories of what it's like to work at the White House and live through some of those very demanding and difficult times. So I thought by, I'd start by sharing that my wedding anniversary is September 10th. And President Bush was scheduled to travel to Florida on that day in the fall of, of 2001, and normally I would have gone with him. It was a big education reform event, the first trip to Florida after the Florida recount, which was obviously a, a very big deal. 
But I believe that small decisions sometimes communicate big things. And my husband and son had left family and friends behind in Texas to move to Washington to support me in my job. So I, my husband and I had never missed a wedding anniversary dinner together. And so I decided to stay in Washington and send my deputy on the trip with the president in my place. So I could go out to dinner with my husband that night for our anniversary. And as we sat at dinner, we, we talked through the, the events that had led to that, that night. And we actually felt like we'd already been through a number of crises. Um, a grueling presidential campaign with its 18 months of, of travel and media attention that is so relentless and demanding that by the last few months, the only thing that gets you through, the thing that you cling to and hang on to is the fact that come election day, win or lose, it's over. And then, of course, it wasn't in our case. Um, and throughout the, the Florida recount, I felt as if I'd run a marathon. And I got to the end of the race and stumbled across the finish line. And, and they said, keep going, and we'll let you know when you can stop. Um, it, it was as that, that time was a very difficult time personally. We couldn't put our house up for sale, for example, um, even if we might have been moving to Washington and needed to sell our house because the media would have described that as presumptuous. My son had traveled with us during the final months of the presidential campaign and we needed to get him back in school, but where? Texas or Washington, D.C.? And then when the election was finally decided, we had an even shorter time than usual to put together a, a government. I told my husband that I would be absolutely no help whatsoever in packing and moving our house. And I was right, I was no help whatsoever. So when we arrived in Washington, we, we felt as if a tornado had sort of picked us up and dumped us at the house that my husband had hurriedly found and rented in, Alexand in Arlington, Virginia. My first days at the White House were, as you might imagine, it's a, it's a bit overwhelming and chaotic, and you, you know, it's a blank slate. You go in, and they've erased all the computer screens. There's no nothing there. There's no furniture. The first time I saw my office, it was empty except for an old soda bottle in, in the refrigerator. The president had given me the title counselor, and I knew he wanted me to oversee all the communications functions of the White House, but the counselor title spoke to a broader policy role, and I wasn't exactly sure what he wanted me to do. So the second day, I stopped in the Oval Office, and I said, you know, Mr. President, what exactly do you want me to do? And his answer was short, but the job was huge. He said, I want you to go to every meeting where a major decision is being made, I want you to tell the people in the room the principles that I will use to approach that decision, and then I want you to tell me what you really think. <laughs> so, so my time at the White House was a dizzying blur of meetings discussing impossibly complicated topics. The science behind storing nuclear waste at Yucca Mountain, the Middle East peace process, tax policy, the reform of Social Security and, and education. I used to joke with my assistant about scheduling time for me to breathe. I vividly remember our first foreign policy crisis. It was only 10 weeks after President Bush's inauguration, and one of our US intelligence gathering airplanes collided with a Chinese fighter jet, killing its pilot. We were able to ascertain that our plane had made an emergency landing safely on Hainan Island, but we weren't certain what had happened to the crew after that. And it was so early in the presidency that the President Bush hadn't had time to meet or form any relationships with, with Chinese officials. And so I remember it was a very tense and very uncertain time dealing with a, a government that we weren't really very familiar with. And, and I vividly remember coming from the governor's office in Texas, I vividly remember looking up at CNN and seeing this banner headline, spy plane standoff. And you know, nothing like that had ever happened when I was in the governor's office. And, and I just remember feeling so responsible for, for those American lives. Um, it was three long days before we were able to actually get the Chinese government to allow US officials into the embassy to see the crew to make sure they were OK. And I remember the, the great relief when we finally heard that President Bush was giving a speech and Deputy National Security Advisor Steve Hadley and I were traveling with him and we stepped to the next room, which happened, it was in a YMCA and it happened to have a swimming pool. And that's where we were standing by the swimming pool as we got the call from our officials that they had actually seen our crew members and they were alive and well. About a week later, the phone rang at my house in the middle of the night, I think it was 3.30, 3.45 in the morning, Waking us all up, and from the adjacent room, I, I heard the voice of my son saying, I hate working for the federal government. <laughs> because this phone call had just awakened us all in the middle of the night. I'd been called in because 
We were working out a letter expressing our regret and sorrow for the loss of life of the Chinese fighter pilot. And later that day, the crew was released. And I just remember our sense of great relief and happiness that we had been able to defuse a very difficult situation. We had some other difficult situations in the early months of the presidency as well. Um, President Bush, as he took office, the economy was falling into recession, and he worked very hard that spring to get Congress to pass his tax cuts to stimulate growth. We'd been on, a, I think, a couple of international trips. We'd had our first state dinner with the president of Mexico. On a personal level, my family and I had moved into another rent house in the District of Columbia, which was closer to the White House and closer to my son's school. Um, so the night of September 10th, as we sat at dinner and reflected, my husband and I felt we'd overcome a lot. And I remember us saying, things can only get better from here. I was scheduled to represent, because I had not traveled to Florida, Mel Martinez, our housing secretary, had asked me to represent the White House at a Habitat for Humanity event on the morning of September 11th. And President Bush did not allow us to wear blue jeans in the White House to, as a sign of respect for, for the office. So I took the rare opportunity to miss the senior staff meeting, sleep in a bit late, and I was in the shower when my husband got a phone call from my assistant who told him, tell Karen that a plane has hit the World Trade Center. Well, my husband knows me well enough not to deliver messages like that because they'll only prompt a bunch of questions from this former reporter that, that he wouldn't know how to answer. And so he, handed, he brought the phone to me in the shower and my assistant told me that it looked pretty bad. We're all assuming a small plane. She said it looks pretty bad, I think 10 or 12 floors involved. I stepped out of the shower, called my deputy, Dan Bartlett, who was traveling with the president. They had just heard as well. We all assumed, it was unspoken, we all just assumed small plane, terrible accident, pilot must have been sick. And I turned on the TV that was in the upstairs dressing room of the, the rent house, and I saw the second plane hit the second tower. And instantly I knew this was some sort of coordinated attack. I, I, dropped to, I remember dropping to my knee and saying a prayer for the people in the building. And somebody later asked me, why not the airplane? It never occurred to me there were people on the airplane. I, I don't know why. It just seemed too horrible. And I called my deputy, Dan, and I said, Dan, another plane has hit the second tower. And I'll never forget. He said, it seemed like such a guy question. He said, what kind of plane? And I said, I don't know what kind of plane. A big plane. I mean, like a passenger plane. Again, never dreaming that there were actually passengers on that plane. I then stayed on the phone with Dan talking through we, what we needed to do. We knew we'd need to talk to the governor and mayor and we needed to you know, get emergency rescue crews off to, to New York. We needed to shut down airplane operations until and the president would need to make a brief statement before he left. I was in constant contact with them until they took off from Florida. And I thought they were coming back to Washington, D.C. I did not know that, that Condi and the vice president had recommended to President Bush that, that um, he should not come back until it, they could ascertain the safety of the situation. And so then suddenly there was silence. I wasn't in touch with the plane anymore. I saw, and I was actually on the phone with my assistant when they evacuated the White House and she said, Karen, the Secret Service is yelling at us to get out. And I said, well, go, get out. Um, and I knew I needed to get to work, but I didn't know how. The White House was reporting that downtown Washington was closing, the offices were all shutting down. Um, I, I didn't know how to, I got a page on my uh, cell phone that said call Signal. Well, I'd never called Signal before, I didn't know the number. I'd always called the White House switchboard. And when they evacuated the White House, they evacuated the White House switchboard operators. So no one was answering the phone. Um, they finally called my cell phone and, and the vice president sent a military car to get me. Um, by that time, we'd managed to, my, to get my son home from school. And you can imagine, I mean, we didn't talk about it at the time, but I'm sure it was very hard for my husband and son to watch me get in a car and head back down to the White House, which they thought was very much a target. We didn't talk about it. They knew it was my duty. Um, I knew it was my duty. As we drove back into Washington, it reminded me of the time that I was a reporter and I went to cover a hurricane. And I was driving toward the coast and every other car was going the opposite way, fleeing the danger. And that, that was that drive into Washington. And I remember looking over and seeing the Pentagon burning. And I said to the driver, I realized, I said, you know, you must have friends there. And he said, yes, ma'am, I, I do. Um, we got to downtown Washington, and in some ways it was one of the most chilling moments of the day because there was nothing, no people, no traffic, 
no sign of movement. The only thing you could even see were some men in black, all in black, and they were holding big weapons. And it looked like a foreign capital after a coup. And, and it just struck me, this is downtown Washington, the home of freedom and democracy, and, and it, it, I've never seen it like this before. And we got to the first checkpoint. There was one light moment. We, we stopped at the checkpoint, and of course, they were very nervous. They'd been told not to let anybody by, and the military driver told him, well, I've got Karen Hughes. I'm taking her to the vice president. And I saw him go radio his superior because he wasn't about to let anybody through. And uh, the, the superior came back and said, said to him, how do you know, are you sure it's Karen Hughes? And the driver leaned, the, the guard leaned down and looked in the window and said, yep, I've seen her on TV. <laughs> so that's how I was identified going back to the White House during this national emergency. Um, I arrived at the White House and the driver dropped me at the east entrance, which I'd never gone in before, and there was no one there. I walked in and there was no one. And I thought, this is not a day to be sneaking up on anybody. So, so I yelled, hello, I'm here, is anybody here? And a couple of Secret Service agents came running, their guns drawn, and I explained to them that I was supposed to meet the vice president, and they took me through a series of underground tunnels to the bunker where Vice President Cheney was. And I had never been there before. We were still so new, we hadn't had the tour. I hadn't been to the Emergency Operations Center. And when I got there, I remember being struck by the calm. Um, I'd been home watching the pictures on TV, people running from the White House, the president not being able to come back to Washington, the downtown Washington shutting down. And it appeared to the public, I realized, very chaotic, yet as I arrived in the bunker, I was watching very calm, quiet, rational, methodical decision making as Transportation Secretary Norm Mineta was there on the phones grand grounding the airplane and Vice President Jane Cheney was consulting on the phone with the Pentagon and with President Bush. I knew someone needed to brief the public about the government's response and to explain what the government was doing because I'd been home seeing it looked very chaotic and the vice president kept saying it ought to be me. Well, I didn't think so. I, I suggested perhaps National Security Advisor, somebody more qualified, <laughs> perhaps National Security Advisor Condoleezza Rice was the one, the best person, or the Vice President himself. But the Vice President and my White House colleagues kept insisting, no, people were familiar with me. I was viewed as someone who could speak for the President. It wasn't spoken, but I think there was also a desire not to have an Al Haig moment where someone rushed to the microphone and, and declared they were in charge, and no one would think I was doing that. Um, I, I, had to, I had tried to call President Bush earlier on my way back to the White House in the car, to, because at the time they were thinking he didn't want anybody saying anything, and I knew if I could talk to him, he would understand the need for us to ha have a briefing. But the operator had, had grimly reported to me, ma'am, I'm sorry, we cannot reach Air Force One. And that was the other really bad moment in that day for me because that had never happened before. I'd traveled all over the world with the president. I'd never seen them unable to reach Air Force One. We'd been told there was a threat against the plane. That later turned out not to be true. But I remember the gravity of that moment and, think, and praying, surely, you know, nothing has happened to the president. When we finally connected uh, for the first time that day as he flew from Louisiana to Nebraska, I remember very much wanting to ask the president, you know, how are you doing? <laughs> but I didn't want to waste his time. So, so I just was very bottom line, direct. I just said, well, Mr. President, I've been pulling together a briefing on what our different government agencies are doing. Do you want me to go brief? And, and he said, that's good, yes, I want you to go out. And then he said, don't you think I need to get back there? And I said, yes, sir, as, as soon as possible. Um, it, he said the Secret Service was adamantly against it, but he was going to come back. He didn't want to be seen as being chased out of the nation's capital. And he was going to come back as soon as he landed in Nebraska to convene a meeting of the National Security Council by teleconference. And so the first time I actually saw him, other than on TV video that day, was that teleconference. And, and my first impression was how very focused he was. I mean, he practically came through the TV screen. And he said, we are at war against terror. And from this day forward, this is the new priority of our administration. I remember it was very reassuring to see him. He, he seemed very calm and very confident and, and in charge. And so as I 
prepared to give my briefing, I remember feeling a great responsibility to display those same qualities, to try to provide some reassurance to a badly shaken nation. And as I left the meeting a little early to give this briefing, the Secret Service had decided the White House press briefing room was not safe. And so they sent five agents to surround me, and they literally surrounded me with their weapons drawn and took me out of the White House and over to the nearby FBI headquarters. And I remember fe feeling very vulnerable. You know, we weren't certain at that point exactly, at least we, I wasn't, who had attacked us and, and where our enemies might be lurking. And my colleague, uh, Mary Madeline, who was Vice President Cheney's counselor, very graciously came with me. And I remember being very grateful to have a, a friend at my side during those very frightening moments. For the actual briefing, I'd written it myself. Um, some of my colleagues had called various agencies and we'd sort of, I remember thinking facts and action. I need to convey facts and action. Those will be very reassuring. And so I'd written it up and I don't really think anybody ever approved it. I, I think I maybe told Vice President Cheney and Condi kind of what I was planning to say. Um, and I typed it on the computer myself and I remember when it printed out, it was barely legible because the printer in the emergency bunker hadn't been used in, you know, who knew how long. Um, and, and so, so I, I delivered the statement. I didn't, uh, I, I remember being very conscious of trying to deliver a sense of calm and reassurance that I had seen in the president. We did not take questions and we had discussed that and that was very unusual and we knew the media wouldn't like it but we realized it would be counterproductive to the whole mission which was to try to reassure people because the very first question would be who did this and I, you know, I was putting everything that I knew with certainty in the briefing and I wouldn't be able to answer any questions beyond that. And later that evening, the president came back to the White House. I remember it was very comforting to see him get off that, that helicopter and, and walk across the lawn. And in the, in the days and weeks after, I was constantly reminded of, of the president's calm and, and very determined focus. We were at the White House until late that night, and the next morning when I came to work, I walked into the Oval Office worried about what the president was going to say when he saw the press for the first time that day, and he stopped me in mid-sentence. And he said, stop, let's get the big picture here. A faceless enemy has declared war on the United States, so we are at war. It's going to require a strategy, a vision, a plan, a diplomatic effort, and the understanding of the American people, and you are in charge of communicating that war. Another day that week, I came to work and I walked in and he said, let me tell you how to do your job today. And he proceeded to list five or six things that he thought I would need to do. Throughout that week, it, it was, as you might imagine, very emotional. Um, I remember being struck by the young people um, in their 20s. Most of us on the senior team were older. We had families. We we'd experienced a little more of life. But these young people in their 20s, you know, they, they, I remember being so impressed that they showed up for work the morning after. They were scared, but they were there. Um, we fully expected, it's, it's kind of hard to describe the environment, the Secret Service, as you might imagine, was completely on edge. We fully expected additional attacks at any moment. Um, one morning that week, we got back to the Oval Office. The President had gone to visit some of the people who had been injured in the attack on the Pentagon. And the Secret Service Director was there and he met the President at the door and said, Mr. President, we have to go. There was another threat. We need to evacuate immediately. And the President looked at him and said, I'm not leaving. And then he looked over to his steward and he said, besides Ferdy, I'm hungry. He'd been dieting, eating salads and fruit. So I noticed when he said, and besides Ferdy, I'm hungry, I'll have a hamburger. Well, so that was it then. I remember thinking, we may die right here. And I looked at him and said, well, you might as well have cheese. I remember one particularly grim day, um, we had meetings about how to respond if, if terrorists detonated a nuclear or radioactive device in a major population center. And it was such a hard day and it had been such a hard time that I, I stopped in the Oval Office to, ch to check on the President and I said, I, I know this must be very hard on you, are, are you okay? And he looked at me and he stabbed his finger on the desk, he was not willing to indulge in even a moment of that thinking, he said, I have never been more clear-eyed about what I have to do. I have a favorite story about the President's focus in, in those days. The Sunday after the attacks, he had been at Camp David meeting with his national security team about the response, and he called me down to the White House on Sunday afternoon to begin thinking about what would become his speech to a joint session of Congress. And 
The president went over an outline. He knew the American people would have a lot of questions. And so we talked through those questions and we sort of went over an outline of what he wanted to convey. And by the time he finished, it was dinner time on Sunday night after the attacks on Tuesday. And I made a big mistake. I decided not to call our chief speechwriter because it had been such a stressful week and he had young kids and I knew it was probably the first time he'd been able to be home with them and I think Sunday's sort of a day for family and, and so I thought, well, I'll see Mike tomorrow morning first thing and we'll get to work on it. Well, Monday morning first thing, I saw the president before I saw the chief speechwriter and the president said to me, how's my speech coming? And I said, well, Mr. President, I'm gonna get with Mike right away and we'll get on it. And he said, well, you better hurry up because I wanna see a draft tonight. Well, anyone who's been involved in, in major presidential speeches know that just doesn't happen. When you usually work on them for weeks. I knew we didn't have that, but I thought at least several days. And so I, I sort of aghast looked at him and said, well, Mr. President, that's just impossible. And he smiled and said, by seven. And so <laughs> I frantically called Mike Gerson, our chief speechwriter, and I said, Mike, you know, I, I made a huge mistake. I should have called you last night. Here's the, here's the outline. He wants a draft tonight. And Mike said, that's impossible. And, and I said, I tried that. And he said, by seven. And so we frantically divvied up sections of the speech and got various people writing on it. And we got him a draft. It wasn't by seven, but I think by eight or so. And, and for the next two hours, he proceeded to call me as he was reading page by page. Page three, paragraph seven. That doesn't work at all. Page five, you need a whole new section of that and on and on and on until past what I thought was the time he usually went to bed. And the next morning, of course, I ran into the president first thing in the White House and he said, how's my speech coming? And I said, Mr. President, I I've just been in senior staff meeting. And he said, and you're on your way to work on it now? And I said, well, Mr. President, I've got a message meeting. And he got about this close to my face with those blue eyes twinkling and he said, and you think a message meeting is more important than my speech to an historic joint session of Congress when our nation is at war? Well, not anymore, I didn't. <laughs> the president had just clearly focused me on my priorities, and that's what he did for all of us in, in the days and weeks and, and months, even years after the attacks. At the same time, I remember the president showing great compassion. All of us were struck that in the midst of, of difficult decision-making and planning for war, he took time to ask how our children were doing. I remember at the end of one meeting, he, asked Mar he stopped Margaret Spellings, who's now uh, the, the di director of the foundation here. Um, he, he, took, he said, Margaret, how are your girls? How are they holding up? Are they, I know they must be scared. He asked me about my son, Robert. During a meeting with the, the press in the Oval Office, a reporter asked the president how he was holding up personally in, in the midst of all this, and he struggled to control his emotions. He said, well, I don't think of myself right now. I'm a loving guy, and I'm also somebody who has a job to do, and I intend to do it. This is a terrible moment, but this country will not relent until we have saved ourselves and others from the terrible tragedy that came on America. And he had some tears in his eyes and he kind of choked up and afterward he excused himself for a minute and kind of composed himself and he came back out and he apologized. And I said, Mr. President, you don't have to apologize for having a big heart. Later that week, we went to New York where I again witnessed his, his great compassion after the much publicized bullhorn moment, which was also an incredible moment that's chronicled here in the museum. Um, he went privately to a room that was full of the families of police and firefighters who were missing and believed dead at that point. I have never been in a place so full of raw sadness. Um, a member of our advance team said he'd been doing this for 20 years and he'd never seen anything like it. I, I couldn't stand it. The emotion was so intense and so heavy that I, I felt like my head was splitting. I literally had to leave the room after about 20 minutes. But when I composed myself and came back 20 or 30 minutes later, the mood was so much lighter. The president had been asking people about their loved ones and getting them to share stories. And there was even a little bit of, of laughter. And the president spent almost two hours in that room, much longer than had been scheduled. And it was really one of the most amazing moments I, I witnessed during the presidency. I emailed a friend that night, and I'll share a few of the excerpts just to give you a sense of, of what I was feeling at the time. I said, Claire, I was with the president in New York today and had three major reactions. First, horror. It's hard to imagine such evil, such fanaticism, such that you wouldn't turn away before crashing an airplane into a building full of innocent people. Second, terrible sorrow. 
So many lives lost, so many families grieving, so many children who've lost a parent. There is quite literally a hole in the heart of Manhattan. Yet in the end, I said, inspiration. I cannot describe the incredible feeling, and I still get goosebumps when I think about it today, as our motorcade drove down 42nd Street leaving the city to look out and see thousands of New Yorkers, New Yorkers, lining the streets with candles shouting thank you to the volunteers and God bless America. In many ways, that was the most emotional moment of the day. The president is awesome. The rest of us are taking our lead from him. I'm holding up well, I continue in the email. My faith helps sustain me, and as I was standing next to a formidable concrete block building in downtown New York, looking at the remains of what had been two even bigger buildings, I realized that so much of what we take for granted and assume is permanent is not. Ultimately, only God and his love are enduring. And another neat thing about this week has been to see so many Americans of different faiths come together to say that. I pray your daughter's fears and the fears of all America's children will be comforted. I've moved my Bible from my briefcase to my purse. Love, Karen. And by the way, my Bible is still in my purse today. As I think about that, those weeks, I think, as I said, about the president's focus. I think about his compassion. And finally, I think about his unwavering determination and resolve. When I see members of our military, even today, one of them said this to me on the, on the phone last week, they frequently tell me he never wavered, and he didn't. Not in public, not in private, not ever. After the attacks and, and years of war, the tragedy of Hurricane Katrina, so many things that had happened over the course of the presidency, it seemed almost impossible to me, home in Austin, Texas by that time, after a, a tenure at the White House and later the State Department, it seemed almost impossible to me that President Bush faced yet another huge crisis during his final months in office, the most significant global financial crisis since the Great Depression. I remember watching from my home in in Austin and just feeling so badly for him. And I remember I called him one morning and I thought maybe he just needs to talk to a friend. This has got to be terrible, you know. And I, I said, Mr. President, I, I'm just so sorry. What else can happen on your watch? And I'll never forget his answer. You know what he said? He said, it's a good thing we're here to deal with it. No self-pity, no why me, just the confidence that he had a good team and they would make the best decisions possible. When I look back now, it's been almost 13 years since I was privileged to first drive through those White House gates onto the grounds. And I'm proud to be able to say that despite all we went through and perhaps because of it, I have even greater respect for President and Mrs. Bush and my colleagues at the White House today than the already great regard I had going in. And I'm glad that George W. Bush and his team were the ones there to deal with it. I remember the first time I stood at the door of the Oval Office, contemplating the big job ahead. They had moved the furniture in during the inauguration, during the transfer of power. And I remember being so comforted to see a familiar painting hanging on the wall. It had hung on the wall of his office during the entire time he was governor of Texas as well. And it portrays a horseman riding up a steep hill. It's based on a Methodist hymn called A Charge to Keep I Have, and it speaks to serving a cause greater than self. President Bush kept that charge, and those of us who served in his administration consider it a privilege of a lifetime to have been a part of it. Thank you so much. God bless you all, and I look forward to your questions. Thanks, Alan. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you so much, Ambassador Hughes. Ambassador Hughes has agreed to answer some questions. So we have microphones. If you'd wait, if you have a question, raise your hand and the microphone will come to you. Any questions? You want me to stand? Okay. Uh, by definition, when you and your staff went into the White House, you were uh, 
new to the game. And my question is, how long do you think it took to where you, not just yourself, but the staff really kind of knew where the ladies' room and the men's room was? <laughs> Well, you know, it's a funny story. Um, it, it took, he asked how long before we knew where the ladies were and men's were. It, it, you can imagine, it's kind of, I remember waking up the morning I was going to work at the White House. And it was about six in the morning and we were crammed in a hotel room in Washington. I didn't really know exactly where I was. My husband and our two children were in the room with us because they only had what they give you one room and you had one room. And so my two, one of my daughter was grown and my son all crammed in a room and it's six in the morning and I'm brushing my teeth and my husband walked in the bathroom and I looked at him and I said, I'm going to work in the White House today. And he looked at me kind of like, well, of course this is what this all has been about. You know, <laughs> duh. <laughs> you know, but, but it just hit me. And it does take a while. It's, it's sort of, you know, as I said, you walk in and it's sort of a blank slate. You don't know where the stairs are. You don't know where the hallways are. You don't. It, it's a funny story. One of the things that my friends who knew about Washington um, had called me when, they, when I first was named counselor to the president, which was right after the election was decided, a couple days after that. My friends who knew about Washington, Mary Madeline and Margaret Tutwiler, they called me and they both asked me the exact same question. And I thought it was so weird. It wasn't like, do you know enough to do this job? Or, you know, what do you know about foreign policy? I mean, we used to joke we had foreign policy in, in Texas, Mexico, and Oklahoma. Uh, but, <laughs> but it wasn't that question. They asked me, where's your office going to be? And I thought it was ridiculous. I was like, listen, we're, we're, in tar we're, you know, we're putting together a government. We're picking cabinet members. What do you mean, where's my office going to be? And Margaret called back and she said, Karen, I know you don't think this is important, but it's really important. And I finally realized what they were saying is how close to the Oval Office are you going to be? You know, how close to the seat of power? Um, but you don't ever know. You don't know until you get there where your office is going to be. And when I had visited, there was no counselor at the end of the Clinton administration. So when I had visited, the closest counterpart was a communications director. And her office was down in the basement. And it was horrible. I mean, I thought, I, and I, I remember thinking back, maybe Margaret was right. Maybe I should have paid attention, you know, and, but I hadn't. Um, and there were no windows. And I thought, well, I guess I can stand there anything. But, you know, but so I was very relieved that um, whoever was in charge of the offices, and I'm still not sure who, but had put me in a beautiful second floor office with lovely windows. And I was able to look out and see the residents. And so I felt very privileged to be there. But I did bump into quite a few walls trying to make my way from there to the Oval Office several times, just trying to figure out, you know, where you are. And as I said, on the, on the morning of September 11th, we all realized we really had never had an emergency briefing. I mean, what, what do you do in case of an evacuation? What do you do? Where is the bunker? What, you know, we, that had never happened. Um, so it, it is a little bit overwhelming to, to walk in and realize you basically start running the government from scratch. And literally, there's nothing on the computers. <laughs> <laughs> you take it away, That's right? right. <laughs> Any other questions? There you go. Yes, how did you tell the president that you were leaving and what was his response? <laughs> leaving to come back to Texas. I bet that was hard. Well, as you might imagine, that was the hardest thing I think I've ever had to do. It was the hardest decision, certainly, that I'd ever had to make. Um, and it frankly seemed like an impossible decision. I, I'd always believed that. Um, I say to young people now, you, you can have a career and a family. You don't have to choose one or the other, but you can't have it necessarily all, all the time. You have to make choices along the way. And, and um, for the first time at the White House, I felt like my career was, was basically not allowing me to be the wife and mother that I want it to be. Or to, you know, I left home in the morning very early. My family was often still asleep, although my nice husband would get up and warm the car up because it was so cold in Washington. He would get up for me sometimes and get the car warmed so I could drive in to give me a few extra minutes of sleep. Um, but my son was still in bed. I came home. He was already downstairs doing his homework. And anyone who's had a teenager knows they don't drop everything and act delighted to see you when you get home from the office. They, you're basically intruding and they grunt at you, you know? <laughs> and so. Um, uh, so I, I really felt like I was not able to fulfill my obligations as a wife and mother. And so I, at home, my, my husband and I had talked about giving it a couple years. And after about a year and a half, it just, it just didn't feel like it was working. And so at home at night, I'd be convinced I, I had to move back to Texas. This just, this just wasn't right. And then I'd go to the office and we'd face this series of challenges. And the president was working on a big speech on Middle East peace. And we'd have all the, and I'd think, well, there's no way I can leave. And then I'd go home again and think, I have to leave. <laughs> so this went on for about a month. And, and finally, I, I just made the decision that, that I 
um, could serve the president from afar in Texas if he still wanted my advice, but I could not serve my family in the circumstances in which I was having to work in Washington. And so, um, as you might imagine, I was very nervous. Um, uh, I, I went in to, to, I looked for opportunities all day one day to tell the president, um, and there was a deadline because I had to enroll my, we had to enroll our son for the next year in school, which was expensive. It was a private school because really, if you want your child to be educated, you can't send them to DC public schools. And so um, uh, we had to, a deadline of May 1st, and so I had to, and we had reporters in the school, and I knew immediately if we didn't, register for next year, the reporters would all know and want to know why. That's the kind of public life you live in Washington with your private life. Um, and so uh, I looked for a moment all day one day in late April to tell the president that, that I decided that I needed to leave. And at the end of the day, I knew he frequently went for a walk outside and I sort of dropped into the Oval Office and I said, Mr. President, and he sort of looked a little annoyed because he was probably trying to get out the door for the day. And, but he looked at my face and he said, what do you need? And I said, well, can I talk to you for a minute? And uh, he said, sure, come on. And we walked outside and I thought carefully about what I would say. And I said, Mr. President, I love you, but I need to move my family home to Texas. And he sort of registered that, he didn't say anything, and then he looked at me and he said the best thing he could have possibly said, I think, he said, will you still be involved? No, you know, how can you do this to me? <laughs> no, no, what do you mean you're moving home to Texas? He said, will you still be involved? And I thought it was wonderful, and it, it says a lot about the kind of person he is, and, and uh, I said, of course I'll be involved, I want to be involved. And so he said, well, then we'll just have to figure out how to make this work. So, you know, and we started talking through the, the, uh, the details and the logistics of it. And uh, uh, Mrs. Bush actually uh, made me feel wonderful about it, too, because I wanted to go see her and let her know in person. And, and the president, I think, had already sort of previewed it with her. <laughs> and so I walked in and she said, I don't think I want to hear what you're going to say, but if it were Barbara and Jenna, I would have done the very same thing. So that was very nice, and they were. And fortunately, I was privileged to continue to be involved. I, I traveled even with the president some after that, and he asked me at the time I left if if I would come back and travel with him during the final months of his reelection campaign in 2004, because I had always traveled with him on the road during his campaigns, and so I promised that yes, I would do that, and I, I was able to do that, and so that was that was a, a great opportunity. And you know, I considered myself very privileged to be able to do what I thought was right for my role as a mother, and also to continue to be involved. Uh, thank you for your wonderful presentation. Uh, the question I had is House of Cards has become an online sensation, and one of the reasons is, is it really pushes political cynicism, which has become uh, a rampant issue in our country. But from your talk, it seems like the president and his staff genuinely cared about what happened in America. There was no power struggle, no dirty politics. So how do we bridge the divide between what happens and public perception? That's a great question. I've not seen House of Cards. I've heard about it, want to see it. Um, we, we need to get, I think it's on Netflix, right? So we need, we need to get that. Um, because I've heard several people who love it, uh, including I was at Harvard last spring and, and the director of the Institute of Politics there really enjoyed it and, and said we needed to watch it. Um, that's a great question. And you know, it's actually caused me to question the judgments I make about what I see. Because so many of the people that I worked with, I saw a caricature form about them. Um, I'll never forget taking a journalist, Walter Isaacson, into a meeting that President Bush had with a group of Iraqi women during my time at the State Department. And Walter's seen a lot, and he's, you know, he was with CNN, he's, he's covered a lot, he's seen a lot, and he came out of that room and he said, Karen, I had no idea. I had no idea what the President was really like in a room like that. It was just incredible. And it was always one of my great frustrations that I never felt I could communicate the way he really was. And I watched as caricatures about him and about others in the White House developed. And so it, it causes me to question, you know, my own sense of when I, when I hear people say President Obama's very aloof, I think he probably is. But, you know, I, that's my perception from watching outside. And I realize how different my, the perceptions from watching outside some of the people in our White House were. Um, you know, I still, I have to say, um, 
I'm concerned about the political process in the country. I'm concerned about how, how negative and mean and, and divisive it is. Um, I, I still, however, have to say that I genuinely believe that after all my years in the political process, most of the people that I met from both political parties were genuinely trying to make a difference, a positive difference for their communities and their country. They may not go about it in the way we always like, but I think most of them, their desire to serve sprung from that genuine sense. Um, so I don't know. I, you know, I think, I think part of us is the, the public needs to give everybody a little bit of a break <laughs> and realize that we are all human. Um, you know, it's, it's hard. It's hard to, to like, I think it's hard to, to go on television now and if you try to, if you read any of the things people say about you on those nasty little commentaries on the blogs and stuff, it'll just, you know, I used to think, I don't know how the president got out of bed in the morning, some of the things that you'd see that people would say about him. I certainly wouldn't have been able to. Um, but I think part of it is, you know, part of it is the media, the constant, and that was a big difference. Um, I used to explain when, when the governor of Texas gives a speech, the, the likelihood is that the citizens of Texas will see excerpts on the nightly news or they'll get up and they'll read about the speech the next morning in the newspaper and they'll have a chance to sort of digest and think about what was said. That never happens in the White House. The president gives a speech and immediately the next thing you know the commentators are all picking it apart, the other parties picking it apart, the critics are out there. You never have a chance to really process it and think about it for yourself. Uh, I don't know what the solution is. I, I do think that, that I'm troubled by the fact that so much of what I saw was different than so much of what I saw portrayed. Um, I am teaching um, international politics in political science department at SMU, and then many of my students are um, interested in uh, serving for nation um, uh, in their career. Um, and uh, what advice would you give to them? Serving, uh, students serving in foreign nations. Some, some students many of your students are serving in foreign nations? Right, so advice you would have for them. Advice to motivated, ambitious students. Well, first of all, I think it's, it's great that they're interested in serving in other nations. I think one of the, the lessons of my time is at the State Department is that we as Americans need to do a better job of reaching out, of learning other languages, of respecting the culture and diversity of, of different countries uh, across the world. I tried to do, demonstrate that as I traveled to other countries. The world is becoming so much more global and so much more connected that I think young people who are able to respect the cultures and contributions of others um, have a big leg up. And I have to also say that um, I'm the daughter of an army officer and have an enormous respect for our military and for the work that our military does across the world, just the highest possible regard. I also just had lunch, a reunion lunch last week with some of my colleagues from, that I worked with at the State Department, some of the foreign service officers I've served with, some of whom had, one of whom had just come back from a very excruciatingly difficult assignment that was so hard on her and her family um, and her teenage daughters. And so I, I also want to salute our colleagues in the diplomatic corps who do a great job of serving our country um, in many difficult circumstances. I was privileged to, uh, when I first met Ryan Crocker, um, before he was the ambassador in Iraq and Afghanistan, he was the ambassador in Pakistan. And I was able to travel there with a delegation while I was at the State Department and meet him there. And there just are some wonderful um, career diplomats doing great work for our country uh, across the world. And I have enormous respect for their contributions as well. So I hope, and I hope I would encourage your students to get involved in, in public service. As ugly as it looks from the outside, um, I, think, I think you can go into public service, you can keep your principles and your integrity intact, and, and you can make a contribution. Please join me. So, thank you all very much. It was great to be with you. Thank you very much.